G'day and welcome. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Roz White, who, with her husband Michael, owns six independent grocery stores on our, you know, in the Sunshine Coast in our local area. And they have numerous staff. We're going to talk about those things and uh, the 31 years of trading and some of the things that uh, Roz has learned over time and some of the milestones and some of the hard things that uh, her and Michael have gone through. So, Roz, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, look, it's a pleasure. Almost 31 years. Mm. Uh, that's a long time. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of things that you've done good and lots of things that you've done differently. Sure. Um, is that simply a matter of experience under the belt or is there things that you'd totally change mm. if you went back and did it again? Uh, there's some decisions, obviously, that we've, you know, were probably didn't go as well as what we would have anticipated and certainly it's a been 31 years of learning, 31 years we're still learning and that never stops and I think the day that you think you know it all is the day that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing and you should be getting out. Um, so we're always there with our eyes wide open to understand what is next and we're very, I guess, um, if, you, if you're thrilled by it, if you feel challenged by it and you enjoy it, it's a fantastic industry to be in because it's fast paced and ever changing. Mm. So you always have to be looking ahead. So you're really never sure where the journey is going to take you, but 31 years of experience does help. But yes, throughout the 31 years has been absolutely some deep pitfalls. Uh, things that you just never see coming, things that come out of the blue, curveballs that you really, you know, knock you down and on, you know, flat on your backside yeah. where, it requires a lot of resilience to get yourself up, dust yourself off and keep going. And that's, I think, the most important thing. If you make a decision, own it, back yourself in. If it goes great, fantastic, celebrate. And sometimes it doesn't. But the important thing is how you deal with that and how you move forward from there. So, you know, we've made uh, some investments where things have really gone not so good and they have really put us on our backside. Mm. And we've had to claw our way back for sure. All things that have come out of left field that we never expected. Mm. Mm. Unfortunately, that uh, happens all too often, doesn't it? Yeah. The When you bought your first store, yep. um, was it the hardest purchase? Was your first one the hardest one to do? Well, probably because it was the steeper, uh, yes and no. It was the steepest learning curve because we'd come out of banking, so we stepped into a tiny little convenience store in Maroochydaw and knew nothing about the industry. So it was a leap of faith. <laughs> and the initial uh, motivation to actually do it was to scratch, you know, Michael and I scratched up the 35 cents that we had, put it into a pot because we wanted to stay on the Sunshine Coast. Right. We didn't want to enter that industry necessarily. It was just an opportunity that opened up and it was, oh, we could buy that. Mm -hmm. And little did we know, actually, it was quite funny because we were very fortunate to buy it from a, a beautiful couple that after 31 years, Rob and Sandy Cobb, have been long-term business people and Sunshine Coast locals um, that sold us the store. They're our, de they're our dearest, most treasured friends now. We've had, you know, they were just, they were our first mentors and they gave us so much support and, and guidance in those first years. And over the years, we've developed a fabulous friendship. But um, initially when we bought the convenience store, mm -hmm. we had enough money to buy the store. But this is, this is we, didn't, we didn't even realise. We were so green that we didn't have enough money to buy the stock. <laughs> and so they were able to step in and they thankfully, because we thought our dream was over before it even began. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they were very, very generous, kind-hearted, thoughtful people deeply considerate, um, and they said, look, we'll give you 12 months vendor finance mm. to pay off the stock, and that's the only reason we were sort of able to get have a first crack. But, yeah, the night owl for me was very challenging. I I was in banking. I loved banking. Uh, we I, I actually stayed working in the bank for uh, the first period because right, okay. it the store wasn't enough to support both of us. Mm -hmm. And so Michael was the person that was in the store first, mostly, mm -hmm. and then I would work with him uh, on weekends and after hours. Yeah, 24-7 work. 
It was 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, or that's when the store traded those hours. Right, yeah, yeah. and then you had to do yeah. other things after. Right? Well, often, you know, you'd finish a shift at midnight, and at the time we lived at Coolum, and um, we were all renting a house there, and you'd, sh- you'd finish a shift at midnight, and by the time you sort of got out of there and got home, and I had to work full-time, you know, the next morning, at an, I was working in Westpac in, in um, Noosa. Monday morning I had my you know, eight o'clock start yeah. or whatever in the bank, finished a shift on at midnight Sunday night and then you'd not no sooner get home and then an alarm would go off or something. Oh, so you'd yeah. be back in that blooming car checking out, seeing if making sure the ice cream wouldn't melt <laughs> something. <laughs> and then back to work, you know, Michael would be back back there to open the shop five AM and I'd be off to work in Noosa and yeah. But they were you know, they were busy, busy days, but Neither of us were ever afraid of hard work, so. And how long did you work like that for until, at what point were you able mm. to put on staff to assist with those long hours? Yeah, at the, initially we had a couple of staff members. Yeah. They weren't full-time uh, staff members, but they were enough just to sort of help out with weekend shifts and uh, and the afternoon shift. Um, so that was uh, a couple of staff for the first few years. It probably would have been... Um, Probably five years before we really started to develop up a bit more of a team. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Mm. And then we we moved to expansion, which is what a lot of business people are in try and do and what have you. When you look to buy your second store, sure. I guess the transaction itself was probably easier. I'm mm. I'm assuming. Yep. But were you sitting there going, ah, oh, we're back at this again and these hours and yeah. how are we going to do it again? Yeah. Didn't ever think about how we're going to do it again. You just get on and do it. I suppose that's the, you just, you know, there's your challenge, you're doing this, you're going on your journey. So, um, but no, I think, yeah, it was just part of the, like, we had to grow, I suppose, if you mm-hmm. want to keep keep expanding. And um, Michael had a lot of ambition and, you know, we had to grow to survive too mm-hmm. because, and that's the thing, you've got to reinvest to grow. We still have to reinvest to grow. Right. You know, you it depends what you want, but in our industry, you have to reinvest to grow, whatever that might be. That doesn't mean to say you go and buy 9,000 stores. You might reinvest in upgrading your store. You might reinvest in your staff, in your mm-hmm. team, invest in your team to help them grow, to help you achieve the standards that you want. So we have a, we have a relentless pursuit to achieve excellence every day. Now, if you want to have those high standards, if that's the benchmark you want to reach, then you have to bring your team on the journey and invest in them to help them grow mm. so that they do become your advocates, that they do uh, embrace the journey, that they do understand the direction and where you want to go. And so to this very day, we still reinvest to grow. And you said Michael had uh, big plans, and big, ambitions and plans. Mm. Was it mapped out? Was there a certain... How did you do that? Was mm. it a certain number of stores you wanted when you yeah. decided you had the first one or was it some other plan? Uh, I think it was just Michael is still a very ambitious man. He was more ambitious then than I was. I had no real love or, uh, you know, great, you know, sort of strategic plans. Or I was just going on the ride at that time. I was Michael's support person mm-hmm. for probably the first 10 or 12 years. In fact, I actually didn't even enjoy I hate I really disliked it immensely. I was swanning around Noosa in a fabulous corporate suit, yeah. you know, fraternizing with the rostronteurs and the fabulous people. And um excuse me. Um and so and then I'd have to put my night owl uniform on, which is a fabulous, <laughs> lovely, deep, gorgeous green yes. with these big blinking <laughs> eyes on it. Um and, you know, hot put it down into the convenience store and unpack uh, pallets of groceries yeah. and hand price and put ice cream away in the freezer. What do you think I'd prefer to do? Yeah. So it was really, and to me it was just hard work. It was hard work. It was a chore. It was, uh, I was supporting Michael in his dreams. He always had big dreams, Michael, and he still does. But um, so it was, yeah, it took a very long time before I it started to click in for me where I started to develop that fire in my belly. Mm. Uh, which really changed everything then. Sorry, just stop in there for a sec. Yeah. Can you take a focus on your... It's a bit sideways, so... 
So I might be running off on tangents. But... Yeah, that's good. Zoom in and actually check that. Yeah. The point, the sword. Well, on the camera at least, it could be different. Yeah, whereas no, it's already a shed. That's fine. As long as you rip out and standing by, Scott, when you're ready in three, two. There's always different pressures in with business people have. And some of those are time and some of those are financial, what have you. But mm. in your case, one of the big pressures that I'm hearing you say was perhaps the physical workload, the, mm. having a job and then going to do the unpacking of the groceries and stuff after that. But was there something more than that? Was there a, a mental disconnect between two really different roles? Mm. I mean, you're in banking mm. and wearing the corporate suits, as you're mm. saying, and you have to have that game face on and, mm. and that way of thinking. And then you kind of like a, a, a stock picker <laughs> or, a, or a shelf stacker, uh, you know, after hours. I mean, maybe some people might find that therapeutic, but if you're wired a certain way, that could have been problematic for you. How did you handle that? Yeah, it was, uh, well, as I said, I was just sort of supporting my husband um, and, you know, just getting on and getting the job done without any great love or passion for, for that. Yeah. Um, it was really... It's a, it is a big mindset shift um, and I think – sorry, I'm going to stop. Sorry. What was the actual end question you asked? Yeah, you? well, how do you handle the, uh, uh, the, the two different – so really different roles. And I know from someone who who's, does different roles that you have to have a certain mindset in certain things and certain another mindset in another. Was it difficult for you to swap between the two so regularly, like almost every day? Yeah, I guess it was a, a mental shift, uh, most certainly. Uh, and but I wasn't, I didn't really give it a lot of depth of thought. It was really yeah. more, you know, you finish this job. This is my primary role. Then I go and help my husband in the in the business, and uh, and support him. It was probably done out of love, and just support mm -hmm. uh, for that part of my life. So I would just get on and do it. I think the biggest challenge I found was when I did come out of banking. And I did join Mike, Michael and I was in the store on my own. Right. So there was a period of time where Michael actually had a little confectionery run to try and gather a few dollars to help uh, get some cash flow going because we did struggle financially with the store uh, for a number of years. And he was able to do that, which meant I came out of my job and stepped into the night owl and started mm -hmm. running the store right. in Michael's absence. Okay. And I found the biggest challenge for me is because I'm a people person and I was surrounded by people, a team around me, that I was working solo in right. the store on my own. Even though you have lots of customers yeah. coming in, but you don't have teammates. And I yeah, found that okay. a big massive mindset shift. Mm. So you're going from working in a team of 20 or more in a in a branch with you know colleagues and that's right banter support. and all sorts of yeah, stuff yeah yeah and um and then you're sort of stepping into a tiny little space on your own all day mm. moving boxes you know it's a thrill a second <laughs> <laughs> was it lonely I mean there's a lot of it was lonely found it's lonely yeah yeah it was lonely and um that was that was a big that was probably the biggest contrast mm -hmm. to adjust to. Uh, but my customers, I love, you know, I loved my customers and, you know, the regulars, you would know what they wanted yeah. in their, you know, they'd come in every day and you're real regulars and you know what they'd want. You'd, you'd, you'd have it on the counter before they even had to ask. <laughs> yeah. And that was the joy, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, Michael and I, it was early in our relationship. Uh, we were, we were in love. We lived where we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Nothing, everything was, you know, we were happy. So you just get on and do what you do together because it's the start and the beginning of your life together. Yeah. So you've gone from one store to, how long was it till you bought the second store? Uh, four years. Yeah, we right. bought the first store in 93 and the second store in 97, one week after our firstborn. Okay. Oh, well, he why was... not? <laughs> First was born, yeah. <laughs> why not? Let's just get what on and you, do it. You don't have anything else to do with True. the time. That's right. Yeah, just take on another yeah. store. <laughs> and so... But uh, in between had the little confectionery run, which actually right. gave, uh, was uh, provided the opportunity to just build up a little bit of cash flow to then 
be able to buy that second store. Okay. Cool. A- and apart from the learning curve you had on the first store, you're a lo- lot more established in what you think about things and, and knowing that you need money for stock and that now sure. and all ah, that sort of stuff. Right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, we, a bit more eyes wide open yeah. going into the second one. Yeah. At what point then did you say, I want a third one and then a fourth one? Like, yeah. What are your milestones that you hit that you go, yeah. okay, we're ready for another store now? I guess it was um, always, again, always looking for the opportunity. And when the opportunity, I think the most important thing that I've learned in life is opportunity presents itself in many ways. But the thing about opportunity is it's people don't always recognise it. And the first op- the first part of um, t- accepting opportunity is to first recognise it. The second then is to take action. So with the confectionery run, Michael was out and about because he used to deliver these little wholesale chocolate things to all okay. the little convenience stores around the Sunshine Coast. And so that gave him some insight into where all these little stores were. And one of those stores was a little Mount Coulomb store. And it was a very modest little store with enormous opportunity and potential. And so Michael would really just, on his little run, he'd say, mate, it's, if you ever want to sell your store, you know, and he must have pestered him endlessly <laughs> until one day the man said, oh, for goodness sake, Michael, okay, <laughs> I'll sell you the store. And that was sort of, it was more that journey. Yeah. So we were, it was still in the establishment phase. And that, you, I think it was about 2001, uh, when that presented itself, that so opportunity. It third store? Third store, third yeah, store, 2001 okay. or two. Our daughter yeah. was born in 01. She was a baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. Cool. so third. So by the time you get to a third store, is there some point where you've got enough critical mass that mm. it's a little bit easier than just having one or yep. two? Or like, what, oh, what does that look like? You're absolutely right. This is th- There is a critical shift yeah. along this journey because you will start to go from, you know, honestly, we were still, I think, paying people with cash in pay packets and, you you know, handwriting (laughs) your sales journals to being able to exactly, you know, along the journey where you start to build a team. And this, there was a critical point, it probably was about three stores in, Mm -hmm. where I was very conscious and aware, might have, no, actually might have been a bit more than that. Um, where you start to have to develop up procedures, probably four stores in, probably, right. yeah. Because after Mount Cullen, we bought Blah Blah in 04. Okay. So then you are sort of starting to build a team. I think we had a team maybe of about 100 so by then. Mm-hmm. Similarly, don't quote me on that, but somewhere around there. And this is where you start to become conscious of the responsibility and the role that you play in other people's lives right. and that you have a role to lead people, lead a team, have systems, you've got to keep people safe. I know you have to do that the whole way along, but your awareness increases Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you've got a bigger role, bigger responsibility, and things are starting to require more of a formal process, procedure around them. And understanding that at this time then, I had this deep realisation of, you know, how do I motivate my team? How do I keep my team feeling valued, acknowledged, you know, how, how can I make them feel the best they can be? Yeah. And I have a responsibility to do that. I have a duty of care to these people, these families. And we really like the people that work with us. We still do to this day. We, they're cool people. We love hanging out with them. And so um, I was asking a lot of professionals, how do I motivate my team? How do I make them feel valued? How do you know, this was something I really wanted to make sure that I, it, it was a central focus in our business. And I didn't know how to do it. I, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, it's again, learning, 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 learning. And how to manage people is part of the process. And so I could not get the answer. I couldn't, right. I could not identify the answer to that. So I enrolled myself at university and in a Bachelor of Business and majoring in Human Resource Management to understand people, how to deal with people. And did that help you? It it made, I believe, the most significant difference. It had the most significant impact. Knowledge is certainly, it opens up an insight, allows you, being informed allows you to make better decisions. And... 
I learned about due process and applying due process, fair process, and what that was, the tools I needed to create to make sure that that was applied and that's how people feel acknowledged, valued. You create a fair and safe environment for people. Right. That's how you build respect and that's how you build a better team. And did you see that as a pivotal change in your role from being, you know, like owner, worker, whatever, to yeah. now this almost position of leader, motivator, yeah. etc.? Yeah, absolutely. It's been part of the journey. So I've had this whole learning journey myself the whole way through. And as I deepened into the journey itself where, you know, when I went from not lo- loving it, yeah. the reason that I learned to love it is because I picked my head up from what I was doing, from back- stacking boxes. and sta- I, I have a, a phrase that I have coined, which is, who knew you could learn to love stacking baked beans? Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I took my head up from stacking baked beans to looking up to see what I was actually, what we, Michael and I, were a part of this massive multi-billion dollar industry where you're dealing with some of the biggest companies in the world and the smallest companies in the world. And then I immerse myself in that. And once you sort of go on that journey of immer- you know, immersing yourself in what you do, building your knowledge, getting to know, you know, building networks, mm. it just opens up a whole new world and that then helps you develop passion and focus and vision. So, yes, that then took me on a whole new journey of then of being able to create strategy and enabled me to be part more so of Michael's, you know, he knew where he wanted to go, right. but it then enabled us mm. to put structure around what we were doing, where we were going with, with a strategic approach to get us there. So not only that, I assume, completely helped the business side of things, but you're working every day with your husband and mm. a lot of small business owners and medium business owners can do that as well. Some don't. Yeah. Some they can't work together. Yeah. It's a lot do to yeah. work together. Did that structure help not just to work but at home as well? How did that sort of work in together? Yeah, Michael and I are very fortunate. He's very calm and I'm mostly calm. <laughs> um, he's, um, we, we just get on very well. In, at home and in business, you know, we're, we just understand each other very well and there's a great respect. Mm-hmm. And, um, but at, at in, we're very fortunate that, you know, they say pol- we are polar opposites. In every way. Michael's completely different to me Mm -hmm. as a person, his interests, um, but we're bonded by our family values and, you know, the core. We're bonded by our core. So because we're polar opposites, I suppose that makes us, it's harmonious at home. We have a harmonious relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the workplace, it means that we represent and... um, support each other's differences. And so naturally we gravitate to two sides of the business. And so he's, his natural gravitation is towards finance and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mine's more towards people and, um, you know, building the, that compliance, that back end, that structure. I also, uh, you know, utilise or think about our business as you have a family front end Yes. And a corporate back end. Right. Because you have to pin everything down, your vision, your strategy, all has to be underpinned by structure. Um, And so you need that corporatised back end to help you deliver, Mm -hmm. to execute. Um, And so we complement each other's differences in every way. I'm not completely sure of the structure. Is is IGA a franchise or is is it a buying group? How does that? Yeah, it's not a franchise. Yeah, it's uh, we don't pay pay royalties. It's really an alliance with um, the brand. Okay. So the brand is it's like you subscribe to a banner, Mm -hmm. and there are some conditions and guidelines and things that you have to fulfil. 
So it, 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 if you, tie, you have to tie up to some branding guidelines, tie up to their promotional program so that you're delivering right, the weekly okay. catalogue, the yep. promotional program out to your customers. Um, but mostly we are independent and we can create whatever footprint we and whatever goes on in the, inside that store is our own individual character. Okay. which is what sets us apart, I think, from in the market, that we can be so intentional uh, and in, that it create a space that's in tune with our customers in a way that's so agile and nimble that you can, you can connect directly to the, um, the local community. Uh-huh. Mm. The reason I asked that was also that corporate back end that you're talking about, that then is something that you've developed that's not handed yeah. to you on a platter from... Oh, no, no, yeah. no. And this is the thing. This is exactly... It's... Um, I must say IGA as a brand has progressed in that space exponentially. Right. But when you're talking, you know, 20 years ago, they were a new brand into Australia mm-hmm. themselves. They were establishing themselves. It's a global brand IGA. It was established in 1926 in the USA by a gentleman by the name of Frank Grimes. And it was, uh, um, and that that, uh, didn't come to Australia until 1996. Oh, right. And so there was 10 stores that were owned by a fellow called John David who, um, he brought that brand to Australia and it was only in 10 stores in the early 90s. So it, it through, they were going through their own establishment mm-hmm. phase in this country. So a lot of that back end strength did not exist. And if you didn't create it yourself, yeah, so, you know, I, I spent many years building structure, building policy. Mm-hmm. Proce- we still write our own policies. We still develop our own procedures. Um, but actually, I about 2010, 11, I was the chairman of the IGA State Board in Queensland okay. and first female ever um, in the history of the brand. And I recognised, because obviously I had an interest in people and been to university and that sort of thing, studied human resource management, and I realised that, you know, there was a big gap for training solutions in the brand. And we all know that we have to train our people if you want best outcomes, if you want consistent practice and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. So I had developed and written a lot of that stuff myself. And so in my position as chair, I was able to say to IGA Australia, to the powers that be, you know, we need to create a training academy or, a, or right. you know, a, a sort of a, a, so where all of the network can, we can have consistent access to training for consistent standards. So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to be connected to the national team, work with a fabulous lady there by the name of Kelly. Mm-hmm. And we started to, she used to fly up and I gave her all my content uh, that I'd written and created. And together we started the IGA Training Academy, uh, which was funded by IGA Australia. And now that's rolled out 1,400 stores right across Australia. Oh. So Excellent. that provides support to all of those businesses and it equates to about 65,000 employees right. right across the whole of Australia. And the beautiful thing about that is my my team get to utilise it too. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. In this country, there's the two big players with grocery, uh, Coles and Woolies, and I'm assuming a third is might be Aldi. I don't mm. know where that sits, right? Um, mm. Has that ever been a consideration of for you when you're buying more stores or setting up more stores? Or was it simply a matter of we know our clients, we know the people who are coming to buy from us mm. and they're not really the people that go and shop at those stores anyway? I respect uh, my, retail, my fellow retailers right across the entire market. Mm-hmm. So I respect what they do, I understand what they do and I understand where our differences are. And then we just um, focus on what we do and our customers. Mm -hmm. So I am aware of what they're doing. I keep tabs on what they're doing. 
but I have a clear focus on what we do. And it's mostly nothing like what our competitors do (laughs) intentionally. So um, it's very important to understand the full market that Mm -hmm. you exist in, respect your fellow uh, market players, and don't, yeah, look, it, it can, there are continuous, there's potential challenge there. Like we have fallen on our knees because of a major competitor that is, because they are a bigger, they're, a, they're a beast. They're, they're a beast, bigger. right? Yeah. If you go head to head with a beast and you're the, you know, the little person, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that, you know, there's a bit of a disparity there, right? <laughs> so if you, sometimes it doesn't always work out and, you know, and that has been a situation that has played out for us very unfortunately in the past. Mm-hmm. We've moved on from that, but definitely have been deeply impacted by that in that scenario. And I don't dwell on it, but it, it's, it does leave you with understanding and respect. Mm -hmm. Um, And I suppose that experience builds resilience and also makes you more uh, determined Mm. to then, you know, not be subjected or subjective. Focus on your customer, focus on your community, Mm -hmm. focus on how you can be different, focus on how you can differentiate. And so we have a very clear focus about that. That threat is always there. Mm. It will never, ever leave. Yeah. But if you let it intimidate you, that would then stymie your own personal and professional growth. So you could sit there terrified, not reinvest, not grow, mm-hmm. not adapt, not evolve to the market, not meet the consumer's needs or excite and entice them to um, be a competent and, co- and uh, competitive market player where they don't, you're not providing something special to them where they're, you know, if you're not doing that, if you're not reinvesting, if you're not growing, if you're not creating a space that is a market differentiator or giving them something really enticing to come in, then you, you're you never going to, you'll just keep going back that way. Mm. Mm. Without, I don't want to dig up the past. But for other people watching who have competitors, whether they're as big as the ones you face or just even in general. Sure, yeah. Are you talking about a time when you, did you have to close a store because there was a a competitor open to store? Yeah, it was, uh, we had to basically walk away from that business. Okay. So uh, it wasn't, it just didn't, we couldn't financially make it work. It was, became unviable. So how did you, what did you take from that? learning, which is one of those unenjoyable learning curves, Sure. Mm. <laughs> to make sure that that really wasn't going to happen again. Mm. What did you do differently? Was it site location? Was it uh, a size of the site or like what did, what changed? Um, you become very aware of your competitors in the market and you do everything you can to be able to protect the market that you're in. Mm-hmm. So yes, you'd, your level of awareness increases exponentially. And uh, you don't want that to happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was another critical point, was it? It was this kind of like mm. almost broke breaking point for yeah. you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. We were on our knees. Mm. But, you know, you've just got to gather yourself together and get up and then tomorrow's another day. Just keep going. And you talk about uh, determination and understanding, you know, your, your market and your customers. Were you... Was one of your ideas the sort of the local connection to suppliers mm. and then displaying that in the store? Like, yeah. or was that a general IGA concept? No, that? Um, that the Locoville program is exclusive to our six stores on the oh. Sunshine Coast. Uh, that's trademarked. I um, oh. It was actually my idea creation. So we'd always had, I'm a farm girl. I grew up on the land and, um, and I've always had a deep connection to primary production. That's mm-hmm. how I grew up. You know, my, my father was, you know, he used to grow crops and cattle, beef cattle and 
spent many years with my dad in the cattle yards and on tractors and trucks. And so it's in my DNA and I understand it right to my core. Yeah. So I've always had a deep respect for the production of our food and you know where food comes from. And so always, I guess, also recognise that by bringing in fresh local produce that's different sets us apart from our competitors. Mm-hmm. So for many right. years we've been we'd actually been practicing this from the very few suppliers that were here I would have to go to the markets and fossick around and try and find right. these products because you know if you look in say you know 15 20 years ago 25 years ago there was there were not many there were lots of local, local farms around but there weren't many sort of producers of condiments and dressings and that's right. Ex- artists and bespoke products, they just weren't a thing. They weren't They weren't here. They didn't exist. But the odd one or two that did, like Sue's Cuisine, The mm-hmm. Essential Grain, these are some that were early, uh, that were in the markets, you know, Noosa markets, Yamanu markets and whatever. And so early days I would be there seeing if I could get them into our store. You know, we had little old rattly old stores and... You know, they weren't that appealing. You know, we were still learning and growing and whatever, but I just could sort of had this, I don't know, this deeper vision that I wanted to have these, you know, gluten-free. Oh, my gosh, nobody stopped gluten-free. Oh, we got gluten-free <laughs> bread. Oh, fabulous. And um, so then we sort of accessed the lettuce from the local lettuce farmer, um, Maruchi River uh, lettuce we got from a lovely couple, Laurel and Nigel Kemp um, at Bly Bly. Camp Flat Road, mm-hmm. and they grew, had their own lettuce, and we were bringing that into the store, blah, blah. So we started to accumulate, a, you know, a few lines, probably only a, thousand, a couple of thousand dollars a year of produce, but, you know, bringing it in. And um, but anyway, it started to accumulate and grow. And then one day, I was just sitting at home on the computer and just going, I need to put, wrap something around what we're doing so. You can't sell a secret, right? Sure. I need to wrap something around this, what we were doing, so that the customer would understand and identify that this is local produce. So, you know, how I'm not communicating, I need to work out a way to communicate with the customer so when they came in, they knew that was Marucci River lettuce. Mm -hmm. It's not lettuce that's been in a storehouse somewhere for however long and travelled 9,000 kilometres. This lettuce was grown two kilometres down the road Mm -hmm. and it was picked this morning. Yeah. And you could have it on your beautiful dinner plate tonight and share with your family. Nothing more nourishing, better quality, less food miles than that. How beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so I sat on the computer and I'm just Googling local markets, farmer, grow. Anyway, this term came up, locavore. It's a Wikipedia term. Right. And it means uh, that a locavore is a person that chooses to consume food that's grown or made locally right. and I just went boom that's that's it and I just created a whole program which is now known as the locavore program and got my graphic artist to go to a little symbol which is a little tractor yeah so that when the customer comes in they look for the tractor which is now trademarked to us they go that's a local product it's locally grown locally sourced and now we buy $35, $40 million a year mm. from our local region because it's grown here and produced here in abundance and it's a primary focus in our business. That's, that's really impressive. We're talking about the, the stores. In the first three or four, you mentioned you had kind of purchased existing stores. Have you created a new location for a store mm. from that point? And mm. what was the catalyst for that instead of purchasing another yeah. location? So the very first store we built was in 2006 um, at a little place down in North Brisbane called Rothwell, oh, yes. near Deception Bay. Mm-hmm. And I kind of have a giggle about it because absolutely no idea what I was doing. Michael and I, we were just like, oh, yeah, we're building this store. And it was just a different type of opportunity. And we sort of stuck our neck out. Mm, we're outside the Sunshine Coast area, and we built this store, and it was okay, you know. Um, cut our teeth there. Yeah. 
And so part of when we lost our, you know, how we lost financially, Mm -hmm. we actually had to sell down three of our stores, Right. right? So that we could, that was part of the process of survival. So that was one that went um, in the process of rationalisation. Okay. Um, but it was it was probably yeah it was a, it was our very what we call a greenfield site, which you know where you put a store on the ground and so but you design it, create it, and work with the team in Metcash and property IGA mm-hmm. property to help us do that, okay. and another company TRG that still exists now, and uh, helped us design and. Build the new store. Absolutely no idea what we were doing. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. So, you know, you had your ideas, but it, we really heavily lent on other people. Yeah. And then um, then we sort of started to, and then in 08, we rebuilt a new footprint for Mount Coulomb, our Mount Coulomb store. Right. And so it was a brownfield type kind of thing. So we went from this store, built a new footprint over here, okay. but in the same centre. Um, and so learnt a little bit more yeah. and then it went from there and then we built, um, rebuilt the Bly Bly store. So took it from a tiny little store yeah. and demolished it and then moved into a temporary location and then built a big supermarket six times the star- size. Right, okay. So that was 2013. We opened that and then 2016, we did another greenfield site at Pridgian Beach so all the time, my knowledge is building mm. and you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So, you know, every single store now, I basically start with a piece of paper. Right. And start that's, from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So Perigian Beach in particular, so by this time after we built a few, you learn a lot, gain a lot of insight, you know, um, gather your vision and your focus and start to really understand where you where where you're going things become clearer 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 and Prigian beach literally in the middle of the night two it was about half past two in the morning i woke up and i just went got an old envelope that was sitting beside the bed and a pen and just scratched out the design yeah right okay of what it was that it was the beginning of what that story is today yeah. And then um, sent that off and started to build on that. So it literally started with a scratch on an envelope. <laughs> and um, and then, of course, you have a whole team. You know, have, you have a supermarket draftsperson or an architect that's got to draw all the plans because there needs to be hydraulic plans and mechanical plans. And you've got to consult with all those, you know, professional consultants to make sure that all the underground infrastructure under slab works is all, yeah. you know. So there's a lot to it. Uh, you work with the design team, you have a project team, you've got to source equipment, you, you know, you've got to recruit a whole team. So it's not just one person, but it most certainly does start with here in my head. And that's now how we create. So, so, so on your Rothwell store, you were working with the IGA property team and yep. Met, Metcash, whatever. Yep. So they were the developers uh, and were uh, you just the store designer like or were you straight in as a developer then uh no 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 we would have been a tenant yeah just so tenant, they yeah. would have found the site right offered it to us and we would have negotiated then with the developer or the um the owner of that building complex yes taken a lease on that you know whatever it was 600 square meters mm-hmm. take out a lease uh or probably um introduced to us through iga property property but then it becomes a direct sure. uh, relationship then with so, them. But so you've gone from buying site, uh, buying stores to then a new store at Rothwell. Yep. And then kind of refurbishing or rebuilding your existing locations. Yep. And was Perigian the first greenfield uh, that Rothwell you Rothwell was the first green. Um, so we, the uh, first store that we actually, where we bought Yes. Yeah, that's bought the centre. Yeah. yeah, it was actually Bly Bly. Bly Bly, okay, right. Yeah. Okay. So Bly Bly, we bought the, the centre, and that's another whole big long story. But um, this couple, uh, this two gentlemen, um, Steve and David, David Leslie, Steve and Murphy, um, had acquired the site from a I local David family. Steve. Yeah, do you? Yeah. yeah. So they'd acquired the site from Mr. and Mrs. Elks. 
Mm. Mr. and Mrs. Elks are long term. I think they've passed away now. But John Elks, their son, still owns you know woodland chickens and oh, the yes, chicken yes. farm at yeah. Biwa. Mr. and Mrs. Elks owned the River Markets Shopping Centre. David and Steve had acquired that from Mr. Elks. He'd sold it to them. Right. And so it was a bit of a do or die as well because they came to us and they said, well, we want to redevelop and we want a new supermarket. We didn't have a lot of money because, you know, we were still growing and building. Yeah. And so it, it was almost a pivotal moment too because we really had to put everything that we'd worked for into joining forces with them <laughs> Because if we didn't, it was highly likely with their ambitious plans, yeah. they would have gone and got another tenant. Someone else would do it. A hundred percent. So we had nothing to lose in some ways. And again, we put everything on the line. I often think of it about like a roulette wheel yeah. where you go, okay, everything I've done work for now, I'm just going to put it all on black on the roulette wheel. <laughs> Let's spin. And, uh, and so we... It was nothing to lose and everything to lose. Does that make sense yeah. at that time? Because if we didn't invest with them and, and go into partnerships, we went into a joint venture with them and bought half the centre with them. Right. And But if we didn't do that, it was highly likely that we would have lost everything that we had there anyway because yeah. if we didn't want to invest or we didn't have the um, determination to, to do that, then when the lease came up, they were highly likely going to, you know, hand it to Woolies or a Coles or, yeah. you know, and get their yield and, and you know, but thankfully we were able to work together and that was the beginning then. Was the beginning. So of, after that, how many have you sort of done from scratch and been involved in development of? Yeah, so then well, we redeveloped that whole centre and then yeah. uh, build ourselves a new supermarket there and then Michael started to take on that more that property right. development role, which he absolutely loves. Yeah. And then we were able to take that development right through up, which we've um, it continues right up that whole oh, Blood Life Village. The corner, the yeah. Yeah. And then there wasn't really... Um, Pritchian Beach, we are still a tenant there, so we don't own... Mm -hmm. But, you know, you get handed a box as a tenant, don't you? Sure. So you get a, you get a box, you get a front door here and a back dock there, <laughs> and you've got to make the whole... Or we do everything else, yeah. you know, so... You, the you create the space and then you build your um, developer might give you a cold shell you know the cold shell warm yes. shell developers terms where he might give you a flooring and lighting and cement walls and then you do your fit out yes which you as a tenant you invest and that could be millions and millions of dollars Definitely. in the supermarket it is um so as a tenant you're still investing a lot in that to to be able to drive your business which you need need fridges to run a supermarket yeah and then uh, Forest Glen was the next one, okay. where we've actually uh, we're the developer in the yeah. So and that's on space. your own or still with JV? Or? Uh, we're in JV there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, that's obviously a big move from running stores and designing stores to then designing sites yeah. and having other sure. key tenants. And I know that you've got a couple of key tenants at Forest Glen, for example, like Big Chemist and what have you. Yeah. Uh, or drugstore if in the US. Yes. And uh, how do you go, is that where you and Michael have kind of deviated in terms of, so Michael's looking at that sort of side of things and yeah. the tenants and the mix and the yes. sizes and all that. Yes. And then you're going, okay, I'm designing the store. Because that store is a impressive store. Mm, thank like, you. Like it's, it's really nice mm. and it's has a completely different feel to mm. a, large corporate grocery store, yes. um, which is obviously the, the look and feel you're after. Yes. And I think it's done very well. Okay. Um, but the site itself, like from our perspective, when we look at developments, sure. I mean, that interests us as well. Of course. And the site itself is actually really unique. Yeah. There's a parcel of land behind another completely different but very popular business like Canara down there. Yes. Um, that you really kind of didn't even know there's land there yeah. until you – probably took a drone up or a helicopter yeah. and went, oh, oh, now now there's land there and, oh, there's a supermarket going there. Yeah, well, that's an interesting story too, actually, because, um, and this is the beauty of local intel, right? And there's just some things you can't read in a report. Mm -hmm. It's just on the ground knowledge and connections with families in the community that you live in. There's a lot of power in that. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, that's really how we've built our business. They've been handshake deals and, um, you know, relationship deals right throughout our whole journey, really. Yeah. You know, stores we've, we've bought, they've never been on the market. Right. You know, you're just proactive and you just have conversations with people. And that land that sits there where Forest Glen is, that was owned by a fabulous couple, um, Kirkson and, and Robbie Wershot. And they had their house. That's where they lived. It's right, right next to the grammar school. Mm-hmm. And their daughter, Lucy, was friends with our daughter, Sophie. They're in the same cr- grade. Right. And I'd drop Sophie there, play with Lucy, and we'd sit around and have a chat and get to know them. And they'd come to our place, you know, what parents and yeah. kids do, bring people together. And they were good friends of ours. And then when they decided to sell a massive parcel of yeah. land there, I think there's 60,000 square metres of land, right. something like that. And they went, oh, we want to sell and we want you and Michael to buy. So it, there was another handshake deal, right? Yeah. So these things, this is how, and you just get, oh, it's a great opportunity and start the process and off you go. And, and you know, when if you did a study on that, the catchment, mm-hmm. And this is what, you know, the powers that be to, in IGA, you know, and other decision makers, you make decisions based on, you know, your, your reports done and yes, and you go in and you do analysis and study the catchment, look at the ABS statistics and you start to build up your customer profile and who your shoppers are and how many households and how many 2.2 people per household. Yes. So that should equate to this amount of grocery spend in this area and all this sort of stuff. And that's how you work up and start your cash flows and how you, you know, traditionally. Mm-hmm. But sometimes as you're coming back, drawing on that local intel. And so we lived at Chevalum at the time. Our kids went to the grammar school and local intel tells you the flow. You just know this stuff because mm-hmm. you've lived, lived it. And the location and the flow and how people are... So the catchment figures, the demographics, nobody would have ever invested that or built a supermarket <laughs> there, not in a million years. It was woeful. Yeah. The figures were terrific. Yeah, I bet. And so the powers of B&I Joe are going, oh, my gosh, what have Ros and Michael done? Like, you know, they're, they're on their own here. This is huge. Like, But it was like, no, nope, we've got faith. We know, know this area. Yeah. And so, yeah. And the figures are bad because what most of what it's got to be sixty percent of that suburb is industrial, and there's hmm. aged oh, not aged care, but what over fifty five yeah. dwellings or over sixty dwellings, and there's only a small portion of sort of normal housing yeah. there. But it's such a busy area with yeah. people always transiting yes. through there Correct. multiple times a day. Yes, yes, and that's what you were looking at. Yes, hmm. yes. And it's interesting because Canaro, um, the organic supermarket, you know, we were very conscious and aware of how close they are and we we're very close together. But I always saw that as us being able to work side by side and complement each other's sure. customer base. They have an enormous following and I have enormous respect for them. Yeah. And we sat down with, um, you know, the the people that, that um, Fergus, he was running the the whole operation there for a while, not the owner of um, the whole group. But, and I know a lot of the people that work in Canara and that sort of thing. And um, so we worked closely, sat down, explained what we were doing and always felt that it would be complimentary because there was always this view, oh, you know, that's the end of Canara. No, it's not. Uh, no, we're yeah. going to, because we have complete, we're not an organic supermarket. Yeah. And they do a beautiful job at that and they've got a massive following and mm-hmm. I have great respect for what they do and the fact that they're an independent mm-hmm. and but this is who we are and um, and I think we can sit side by side. And this is the beautiful thing about doing respectful, you know, having respect for relationships and what other people do, coming together as a community and supporting each other and complementing each other to make the customer customer's choice wider and more impactful yeah. if you all work together. Yes. You know, there are, there is a scenario where everyone can win, mm. you know, and that's very in deep opposition to a, a hungry behemoth that wants everything for themselves mm-hmm. and then wants to deliver a standardised 
you know, dictate to the customer rather than creating a space that is for the customer. Mm. And so, you know, and that's what we've been able to create at Forest Clean so that, you know, that whole area, all of those businesses can flourish. How fantastic. But at the end of the day, the customer wins. Yes. Because they have a beautiful heart space to come to and enjoy with access and convenience. Mm. And that's how communities should work together. That's how they should be. Yeah, I agree. That's that's good. Would you say in the stores that you've had a hand in the development from the ground up that uh, that they are a better outcome? The, the, overall, the store is either better positioned or better designed or has a better more foot traffic or is there an advantage to being involved from the ground up? You betcha. Mm. Well, for myself personally, I mean, I'm a bit of a freak of nature because I literally absorb, it, it's an exhausting thing. You know, after we built an open forest glen, oh, I was absolutely exhausted. <laughs> and on the day that we opened, you know, everyone's like, ah, oh, celebration, oh, I want to just go and die somewhere. <laughs> but, um, but because every single cell in my body goes into building and creating that space, every element, so from the ground up, from, this, from you know, the rubble, I'm walking over the, the dirt, I could tell you where those water pipes are, mm. you know, because I've, I've, you know, you're just living and breathing it. But it starts nine or 12 months before then when you start scratching on the piece of paper yeah. and then you're sending your ideas down to the architect. I work with Lauren, who, who works out of IJ Metcash, and she's the one that draws very patient, Lauren, wonderful lady, and she gets my hand, scratchy hand drawings in, with pencil. Yeah. And then um, I'm sending them down to her and she's got to make sense of it and start putting it into a proper format so that, you know, a construction manager can understand it yes. and build it. And so that's a process, goes back and forth, back and forth. So that happen, that can take 12 months by the time you get mm-hmm. through all that. So before you turn the soil, you know, there's been a lot of work done already. So sure. I know intimately everything that sits on that design. Yeah. And I get every space and every inch and it's, just refined and refined and f- refined until it's perfect. And I'm not happy until it is. And then when, you you know, they're in there digging around and they're laying pipes and, you know, I know where those pipes are. You can almost tell, oh, I don't know. And then the cement goes down and then you got, <laughs> you know, and I can, I can walk in and I go, I literally have been able to walk in and go, that needs to move five mil. I know I'm a, I know I'm a pain in everyone's bottom. <laughs> But I can literally walk in and go, that's the wrong colour. Yeah. That's that's out by 10 mil. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I can see it because yeah. I know I created it. Yeah. And so, and it's as clear as a bell for me. Is that your preference moving forward? I mean, are you looking to do more of this type of thing, another side like No, not to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I've... Michael and I become quite selective now where we'll only do what makes sense, Mm -hmm. you know. And we've created intentionally a little pod of six supermarkets within a geographical area that is totally concentrated on our beautiful Sunshine Coast region and um, so that we can be completely authentic about our Locavore program and, you know, our heart in the community, our community. So no intention whatsoever of going outside of the Sunshine Coast. And when is enough enough where mm. you just go, you know, it's it's okay. Um, you know, we've got some debt payoff too. Mm. So, But when do you just go, and I want to keep our, we employ 500 people and they're still family to us. And I, 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 we're boutique. And I, if you grow too big, you lose that you could potentially lose the very thing that makes you who you are and I'm not prepared to do that so the you mentioned debt I mean construction projects rarely happen without it mm. um, and I'm not in the supermarket space but I understand it's very expensive to do fit out and, mm. and acquire it even if it's an empty box right mm-hmm. how has your 
attitude to debt change since being involved in banking yeah. and now being on this end of yeah. the reciprocal sorry the receiving end of the yeah. debt I suppose yeah. and actually being responsible for it well I think some of those insights you know I was a lender in my time and so was Michael where we were lending you know I used mm-hmm. to do consumer lending um, that was one of my roles and I get it you know it's very I think that was that actually helped because you know you can just figure it all out. What's an LVR, and yeah. you know, and your your capacity to to pay debt, and you know, they're really fundamentals that your amortization of your loan, and the and the life of your loan, and your return on investment, and all those sorts of things. Um, everyone should understand that if they're in business. But I think because we were doing it, it, it wasn't scary. It was just that's what it is. So. I think that actually probably empowered us in a lot of way. Um, you always realise, I know I've had moments throughout our life where it's like, you know, when you do take another gamble and another gamble, there's no doubt that I've had moments in my life where I have I have often thought to myself, well, if it all goes pear-shaped, I know I can go back to banking or I can work as a cleaner. I don't know. Yeah. There'll be something that we can have a roof over our head and feed our children. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Not that you want to do that, though. No, of course not. You can not. enjoy doing what but, you're doing. But right? I guess that gives you a level of comfort so that mm. you think, okay, we're going all in here. <laughs> Again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know I'll be okay Yeah. if it doesn't work out. I, I know I'll be able to get up, pick up a job somewhere, you know, and still survive. And as your business has grown and progressed and ups and downs like every business does, and now you're at this size that you're sounding quite uh, comfortable with and um, it's an efficient use of resources and locations mm. or what have you, is it time to say, okay, we're going... Does your business strategy change at this point? Does it go from being we're on this aggressive expansion to now we're yep. just going to be really, really good at what we are, we're going to pay down debt? Like how does all your attitudes of that sort of stuff change? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think there comes a time when it's a responsible thing to do because, mm-hmm. you know, Michael and I are of a certain age. We've still got a bit of life in us yet, don't you worry about that. No intention of selling the businesses or whatever, but you've got to understand, you know, we have children and they've taken their own journey in life and they've got their own careers, which is fabulous. But uh, you've got to think about, you know, you can't just pop off the perch and, you know, who's going to deal with all this stuff? Yeah. You've got to be sensible and forward thinking about, you know, what happens next. And um, and so you just, it's just a continuous review, isn't it? Mm. To do what makes sense for you and your family. And, uh, you know, there comes a time when you go, you know, this is, like I said before, you know, when is enough enough? Or when you you just review the different stages of your life. So we have have been through a massive growth, massive Mm. growth. For 31 years we've been growing. You know, is is year 31 the year where we go, let's just chew some debt down now and just, you know, there's always things to do. You know, I'm still building... And I enjoy it so much. Last week we had a two-day leadership camp with our team to help build them, Mm. empower them to be um, better for themselves, stronger, more resilient, better leaders, equip them and empower them because I want them to enjoy themselves. I don't want want work to be a chore for them. I want them to come to work and feel fantastic and be proud of the store that they run and the team that they lead and the impact they have in the community. So my joy comes from investing in them and helping them to see, to give them tools, build their toolkit so that they can really make life easier for them to Mm. make. But it also, on the business side, ensure our viability to improve our efficiency, to improve our productivity, because that's important to maintain our viability, our longevity in business, because, in as we know, there's a there's a lot of financial pressures mm. right now, and if you're not proactively seeking better solutions to make you more viable, more efficient, more effective, more productive, 
uh, then again, that can be a threat. So we are investing to make sure that we uh, maintain our viability, to build our capability and to maintain our goodwill in the community and within our team and our culture. And that's very targeted, very specific, very strategic, very focused and very driven, yeah. In discounting competition, mm. especially the big competition, what as a business owner, what are your biggest threats right now? Is it is it cost of goods? Is it electricity cost? Mm. You know, what are those things that you've identified saying yeah. over the next 12, 24 months, we yeah. need to focus on this? Yeah. We've activated our um, value pillar in yeah. our business because we know that's very important to the customers. So, and also we've, we're very focused around financial viability at the moment mm -hmm. because just as people are finding it high pressure to, you know, combat the rising costs of living, in business we have the rising cost of doing business mm. in the same way. We've got the same pressures. So rising costs, uh, you know, energy, humongous. The impact of that is just out of outrageous. Yeah. Absolutely outrageous, and there has to be some better solution for the entire nation to address that. And the decision makers need to step up and take responsibility to make sure that there is something that a viable, sustainable option that people don't have to. We cannot cop the increases, the continuous increases. That's mm -hmm. just, you know, that's outrageous. Um, it needs to be arrested and there needs to be a viable proposition in the market. Mm. They need to deal with that stuff, right? Because um, you can't keep going up. Um, so there's there's many rising costs, freight and fuel and levies and taxes and energy and, uh, you know, costs of building goods and you name it. But at the other end, people are finding it more difficult for the same reasons. Sure. So they're then finding, you know, when your budget's squeezed, you've got less in your pocket, you're going to be driven by value, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. And so it's our job to make sure that they understand that we can offer them value in the market when they come in, that they know they're getting, you know, with integrity, mm -hmm. that, that they, uh, we must maintain our integrity and we're very focused on making sure that they understand that we still offer great value to the consumer um, and we respect them. And so there is a big focus because we're seeing it that price pressure is putting more. There's been an, a recent up, big uptake in um, promotional spend, which basically means consumers are buying more specials. Right, okay. So that's very indicative of how consumers are feeling. Okay. You see the way they behave, just the way they buy. Yeah. That's very interesting. That sort of, and you get to data or trends on yep. that sort of stuff? Yeah, we do microanalysis on all that sort of stuff. I mm. get figures every single day. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. yeah, and you can see all that. That's all reported to us. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so on a daily basis, you can see where how the shop is shopping. So if people are feeling tight, their wallets are feeling empty. Yep. They focus more on the specials. Therefore, your special yes. sales so sorry, increase. The transaction increases. So yeah. what happens is when you're when you're special uh, when the participation of promotional spend increases, so they're buying more specials. Yeah then you've got price pressure on your margins mm. because you don't make the sure. same GP out of specials that you would out of maybe another line. Yeah. So therefore that puts pressure on your profitability. So you've got pressure at the mm. at the top end, pressure at the bottom end. So you have to make sure that you're focused on your viability. So how do you maintain your viability? You know, you, you have to be very, very focused on that. You know, utilise technology where you can to reduce energy consumption, which mm. will reduce cost, uh, improve the productivity of your team so that they, um, you know, but in a way where they can become more efficient, but in a supported way, build their resilience so that they can be um, more effective leaders. So there's opportunity there. Yeah. Yeah. It's just understanding what levers to pull or what to activate to make sure that you're focusing on the right things at the right time for the right reason. 31 years in business and, of course, in the corporate world before that. Has your definition of success changed 
from when you started to where it is now? Probably not. The thing that makes me the most happy, for me, success is content, contented, content, contentment. Success is contentment for me personally. Mm-hmm. I am like a mother cat. <laughs> I'm happy with my, surrounded by my brood and my children and my family. It doesn't take much to make me happy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can, I'm my happiest when I've got my family around me, when I'm cooking and feeding them and um, playing some music and going to the beach. Yeah. Happy Roz. You know, don't don't get me wrong, I can enjoy five star too, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that's <laughs> those things are enduring. And so uh, they're the things that still make me happy today. That's good. That's good. For someone who doesn't have five hundred staff, success for me would be just meeting payroll five hundred staff. Mm. That'd be a, a big job. Obviously, you've got people helping you in different areas in the business. Of course, um, because that's just not possible otherwise. No, got the best team ever. And um, and how have you adjusted to that from being such a small team, starting out with say two or three staff, and doing payroll and doing that yeah. to now five hundred and Oh, has payroll been done? I don't know. Is it be, I don't know. Has, has those invoices been Monday paid? Monday morning, you know I mean? they come in bright and early and yeah. I, they don't even let me near. Sometimes every so often I'll have to get on there and do the wages <laughs> and it's like, no, don't let her near it. <laughs> no, there's a, there, we've got some trained staff there. Um, there is a book in case I ever have to go and go, just follow the steps. Do, 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 do. Now, used to be able to do it on my ear once, but... Yes. Um, <laughs> It was a, is it a journey? I mean, some people can't let go of that. Some business owners struggle with doing that, but you've you've had to because of the size that you are. You can't do all the things you used to be able to do. No, and that is a big thing. You've got to overcome that. And I can micromanage sometimes, my husband tells me. <laughs> um, Roz, let it go. Do, do, do. Um, you have to learn that. You have to have courage to overcome that and lean on your team and trust them. Yeah, and even, you know, we do have an extraordinary team. They are passionate and enthusiastic and, you know, they they strive. What The thing that makes me so proud of them is, you know, how they strive for the same things we do and mm. they have that relentless pursuit for excellence as well. They take pride in the standards. And another saying I have is never apologise for having high standards. Mm, that's a good one. And, um, and you just bring them on the journey. So, but, yeah, you do have to rely on them. It does take courage to do that. It's not always easy. But, it, but the important thing is, if with 31 years' experience, you can see, you know, in a, in a just in a nanosecond when something's not quite right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you can recognise it. And like, I have an eye like a, an eagle. <laughs> I could walk into one of our stores and there'll be a, an apple with a mark on it or uh-huh. something and it jumps out at me and they go, oh, <laughs> it's one apple. She has to find it. Yeah. It finds me. I don't find it. Yeah. But, you know, you just get an eye for things and you just get a really, you just know straight away that's not right. That's that's the eye of someone who lives and breathes their business, though. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is a good thing as a business owner. Yeah. Well, I guess so. You know, and that's the level of um, commitment mm. that I have, which is sometimes why it's exhausting. I bet. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. And you've got to love what you do. If you don't, it's too hard. Imagine if I didn't love what I did. Well, you didn't in the beginning. I didn't. But I had more energy then. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, I've got a, a I, don't, I don't think it's a trick question. I've got a question for you. Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, which group of people are harder to manage? Okay. All right. Multiple choice. Boop. Yep. Staff, children, or your husband? Husband, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's his own man. He's got his own character which is actually what drew me to him in the first place. 
He's a man that can stand on his own two feet and he actually doesn't need anyone. That is the strength of character that drew me to him. Mm -hmm. But it also makes it hard to manage. Yeah, well, you know, I just go, oh, well, (laughs) that's Michael. That's Michael. He sounds like a very interesting bloke to talk to. I'll I'll talk to Michael one day. He's very quiet, but he's got an incredible brain. The the time has passed 30-plus years. If you could take one, two or three key points and tell Roz of 30 years ago when you're starting out, what would those key points be? Ooh. Don't be afraid of, of... The one thing I have learned is opening, you know, the you know, you use the analogy or whatever about walking through doors of mm-hmm. opportunity, I suppose. You know, try to be fearless in and courageous in walking through those doors that you don't know what's on the other side. Because if you have the courage to walk through the door in the first instance, it can open up an entire world that you never knew would ever exist. Mm-hmm. And if you if you didn't have the courage in the first place to walk, if you just walked up and went, I can't walk through that door, you will never know what re- what lies behind there. You'll never know what it could have been. Mm. Never know what opportunity or what journey that could take you on, where the destination would take you, what the destination might be. Mm. So that's, you know, and just... Um, yeah. You have to be cautious and mindful and still make decisions based on insight, fact, mm-hmm. be informed, evidence da- evidence-based decision making. But you need a level of fearlessness. You encourage. Hmm. It's good. Ros, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for, for joining me. Thank you. And uh for someone who's has 30 years experience in the in the one industry. I mean, it's not always the case nowadays and it's not always the case that you're still married to the same person mm. in that time frame. There's a lot of successes I see looking over at uh, what you and Michael have achieved. Um, and I think that uh, we've touched on a bit of your story and it's been very insightful and I hope that uh, people get a lot out of it from a business perspective and mm. financial and even if you want to go and open a IGA. Yeah. Well, that's it. Come and see me. Have a chat. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you. All right. It's been a pleasure. That's it from us today. Uh, As you've seen, Roz White and her husband, Michael, been on the expansion bandwagon for 30 years of getting their footprint secured in their local area. And not only that, impacting the community in a really big way through the supply of local produce and also making each one of their stores a specific community on its own. It's a very interesting chat and it's a very unique way of thinking about how to deal with your customers. If you missed any of it, make sure you rewind and watch it again because you're going to get a lot out of it. Well, that's it from me. I'm Scotty North and I'll see you next time.